fasting, their blood pressures start decreasing. Um, and uh, so that is a that is uh, there. What's the mechanism? Well, it, we're not sure exactly all of the mechanisms. One of them is that you have this uh, hormone that's produced from the fat tissue called leptin. And leptin, one of the things that it does is it signals to the part of the brain that controls your fight or flight response. And your fight or flight response, one of the things that it does is causes your blood pressure to go up. So if you're taking a walk and the pack of dogs start chasing you, well, one of the responses of that is your blood pressure starts going up uh, because you want to be able to keep blood going everywhere and especially to your head and other places that are you know, nice to have uh, blood flow. You don't want to have your blood pressure go low and pass out while the pack of dogs is chasing you. Um, so uh, there's that response through leptin, through fat tissue, through leptin, and then the sympathetic nervous system or your fight or flight response, and then increasing the blood pressure. So when you fast, well, guess what happens? You start using up fat tissue in the, in the process, and leptin levels start decreasing, and it helps out with blood pressure. Now another thing that you can do for, for hypertension is, of course, limit your salt intake. That's a, that's a biggie. In fact, there are some, some believe that salt intake over a long period of time is the major cause for increasing blood pressures as one ages. Uh, there are a few populations where they have quite low salt intake throughout their entire lifetime. And in those populations, elderly individuals tend to have about the same blood pressure as teenagers in those populations. So it's really only in populations where you have too much salt intake that you notice an increase in blood pressure over the years as a person ages. And we thought, well, blood pressure was just a function of age. It doesn't have to be. It's just that your age gives an idea that you have been exposed to something for a long time and it's taking its effect. And one of those things is salt. And of course, what are the major sources of salt in the diet? Well, the American diet, uh, cheese, Breads, soups, sandwiches, and pizza are, are the top of the list as far as salt sources in the diet. Uh, and uh, number one overall is breads. Breads is number one overall. Um, if you ever tried to eat bread when somebody didn't put salt in it when they made it, you won't be eating much bread. Uh, and uh, some of the breads, like the French breads and other things like that, you eat it and you're like, whoa, this tastes great, and you didn't even put a little bit of butter on there. And, uh, and the reason for that is because it's got so much salt. Of course, you also find quite, find quite a bit of sodium in animals, uh, animal products as well, because the major electrolyte inside of animal cells is sodium. Uh, and so you want to look at limiting salt to how much? Well. About 1,500 milligrams or less a day. What's that? That's about two-thirds of a teaspoon of salt for the entire day. And that includes in everything that you, uh, you know, not just the salt that you put on your food, but the salt you cook your food with. Now, you know, obviously, if you're cooking a, uh, for 20 people and you put salt in there, uh, the portion that you eat is not going to be the entire portion of salt that you put in there. But just keep in mind, what you put in the cooking also counts towards what go, what's your total salt intake for the day. So again, about two-thirds of a teaspoon of salt or less a day, and that's going to be helpful for your high blood pressure. Also, you want to look at maintaining a high potassium to sodium ratio. High potassium to sodium ratio, that means that you're eating a lot of potassium, but you're not getting as much sodium that's in that. And how do you achieve that? Eat plants. Eat plants. Because animals, again, sodium is the major electrolyte in animal cells, and so if you eat animals, sodium's going to be high, and potassium is really low. Like when you do your blood tests and we look at your blood levels, well, we know that normal sodium levels in your bloodstream should be between about 135 to 145 milliequivalents per deciliter, but when it comes to potassium, you really should be around 3.5 for somewhere in that range. Right? Not 130, 140, but 3 or 4. 
Right? So in animals, potassium is quite low, sodium is quite high. Now, plants, it's the opposite. Potassium is quite high and sodium is quite low. So what are areas where you can get lots of potassium with very little sodium? Well, nuts and seeds, legumes, your beans, peas, and lentils. And of legumes, soy has the best profile as far as the uh, potassium to sodium ratio. Uh, dried fruits, whole grains, just regular fruits, mushrooms, squashes, and potatoes, uh, all of those are, uh, are good as far as their potassium to sodium ratio. If you wanted to even break it down even further, plants. Okay, just eat plants. And, uh, and that's going to give you a, a high potassium to sodium ratio, and that's going to help out with your blood pressure. Also, you want to look at blood pressure reducing foods. There are other foods that have been studied and shown to be beneficial with uh, reducing blood pressure, including barley and blonsillium. Oops, sorry, this thing is blonsillium. Now you can't hear me because I do that, but then I blow on you. All right, blonsillium, blonsillium. Basically, it's basically fiber. That's what blonsillium is. It's pretty much fiber. Uh, it's what's used in like Metamucil and, and other types of get you going type of uh, stuff. Yeah, and, uh, and so on. So if you got high fiber, that helps to reduce blood pressure. So blonsillium is pretty much just straight fiber. You have celery. Well, if anybody's eating celery, you know that's pretty much straight fiber with water in it as well. Uh, and then you've got flax. Flax is really high fiber as well. Garlic, well, it's not so high fiber, but it's got allicin in it, uh, which helps, to, uh, helps with bringing down blood pressure. You've got olives. Olives have been shown to help with blood pressure as well. And you're like, whoa, hang on, it's got lots of salt in it. That's true, olives have a lot of salt in them, but they also help to bring the blood pressure down. So if you're concerned about the salt that's in the olives, and soak them for a while, right? Take them out, soak them for a while so that you can put them in a watery environment and then that salt that's in them can start diffusing out into the water and it can decrease the salt content that's in the olives. And then finally, wheat bran. And of course, what is wheat bran? Fiber, right? That's fiber. So overall, this slide says if you want to eat foods that reduce blood pressure, eat fiber. That's right, eat fiber. So the last one says eat plants and this one says eat fiber. Where do you get fiber? Plants. That's right, plants. There are no fiber in animals unless you eat what the animal ate. You know, the deer was eating some grass and leaves and other things like that, and you eat the grass and leaves in the stomach of the deer, well, then you got some fiber. Otherwise, if you're eating the other parts of the deer, no fiber. Right? You only get fiber from, from plants, and so uh, eat the plants. All right, now there are some supplements that help with uh, reducing blood pressure. Those include things like coenzyme Q10, uh, some evidence that it can help slightly in the reduction of blood pressure. Folic acid, right, folic acid. Uh, guar gum, what is guar gum? It's a tree resin. It's a resin that comes from a, uh, from a tree that gets extracted and... Um, it actually has uh, quite a bit of soluble fiber in it uh, as well, but that has been shown to reduce blood pressure. Uh, there is L-arginine, and L-arginine is an amino acid, and that amino acid is, a, is used as the initial product for the cells that line the, the arteries the endothelial cells, they use it in the process of making nitric oxide and releasing nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator. It causes the blood vessels to dilate, and when the blood vessels dilate, then you've got more space for the blood, and if you have more space for the blood, then you have less blood pressure. That's right. Um, <clears throat> so L-arginine has been shown that if you you bump up the levels of L-arginine, it can increase the production of nitric oxide and decrease the blood pressure. Niacin as well, vitamin B3. Niacin uh, can also help with blood pressure reduction. One of the side effects of niacin, which people don't exactly like, it's like having a hot flash. 
Yeah, you take niacin and you have, you know, it's kind of like having a flat, hot flash. You, 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 you vasodilate, so it causes the blood vessels to dilate, especially those under the skin surface, and then, then you start getting flushed and you feel hot and all of that kind of stuff. And now that I'm saying that, you're going to pull out your papers and start fanning yourselves. And, and uh, <laughs> right? So uh, just even mentioning a hot flash. All right. Um, so... Uh, there are slow-release versions of niacin. Uh, some individuals, uh, you're really aiming for somewhere around 2,000 milligrams a day of, of niacin, but you can start at like 250 milligrams or 500 and then kind of work your way up over time as you develop some more tolerance to, uh, to that. And, uh, and so that can be, can be helpful. Um, and then there are some delayed release forms that don't cause as much flushing and allow you to, uh, you know, allow your, uh, your niacin levels to be uh, elevated over a more, a more long period of time. And there is some evidence to say that vitamin C also helps when it comes to uh, blood pressure reduction as well. So uh, yummy, yummy vitamin C. Now, the only vitamin C that tastes yummy is the one that has sugar added to it because it's citric acid, and acids don't taste yummy, they taste sour. Um, so the yummy ones are the sugary ones. There are some herbs that have been shown to reduce blood pressure, including uh, hibiscus. And uh, so that's a good one, hibiscus, the flower. That's the part of the plant that you usually use is the flower, and so they have uh, dried flour. In fact, you can, you can eat the flour if you want to. Uh, you can go out there, get a hibiscus plant, and you can eat the flour. It's edible. Um, some people like to, to pick it, and sometimes you can suck the, the, the nectar out of the back end of it. Um, and then you can just take the rest of the flour that you didn't eat and uh, go boil it and, and make a tea out of it. Just make sure after you drink your hibiscus tea to wash your, rinse your mouth out with water a little bit because it's a bit acidic. And there's concern that if you keep using it over a long period of time, you don't wash your mouth out, then it starts maybe eating away at the enamel. Um, so that's one concern. Then there's hawthorn berry. Uh, and you see it there, the hawthorn berry. That uh, can be helpful uh, with heart health. Uh, potentially with some blood pressure. And then the other thing that I didn't have listed on there, I'm not sure why, is olive leaf. So olive leaf has uh, some studies with it showing that it helps to reduce blood pressure as well. And, uh, and so eating olives helps and drinking olive leaf tea can help or olive leaf extracts. So a lot of the olive plant as helpful as far as blood pressure reduction is concerned. You also want to avoid the things that cause high blood pressure. So uh, if you're smoking, stop it. Drinking alcohol, stop it. If you're, drink, uh, if you're, uh, if you're drinking caffeine, stop it. Right? All of those are going to be just causing the blood pressure to go up. Uh, and alcohol, it's usually not right away that it causes the blood pressure to be elevated. It's over a period of time uh, that it ends up having that effect, but it does end up increasing blood pressure levels over time. Tobacco can have a fairly immediate effect uh, because tobacco, there are uh, receptors for nicotine uh, on in your muscles, in your muscle cells, and when nicotine hits those receptors, it causes the muscles to contract, and including the muscles that are in the blood vessels. And so it can cause those to contract, clamp down over the blood, uh, and then you increase the blood pressure. And then, of course, caffeine has a similar effect as well. It has a stimulant effect, uh, and so it increases blood pressure fairly quickly, and then begins wearing off about five plus hours later. Um, but the more consistently you drink caffeine, the more consistently your blood pressure will be elevated. Another thing, losing weight. Right? Losing weight is, uh, is another important component of that. Again, through that pathway of uh, leptin, that hormone that's released and then stimulates your fight or flight response and then it causing your blood vessels to contract. 
and then increase in your blood pressure. So as you have less fat tissue, less adipose tissue, then you have less of the leptin and you don't have as much stimulation of blood pressure. And so if you have somebody that has high blood pressure and they also have high weight, that's a good scenario because then you can, you can concentrate on the weight and get the weight loss and you, you know you're going to get gains as far as the blood pressure reduction is concerned. Um, but if you have skinny mini who's also hypertensive, well there's other things to do but you don't have that component that you can work with. You know, you can't, you can't just starve her to nothing and try to get the blood pressure down. There's other things you've got to work on. Um, one of those is staying well hydrated. All right, that's something that's important as well uh, to have proper hydration because one of the things that contributes to blood pressure is the viscosity of the blood. So uh, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of, um, well, uh, pretty much everybody's had the experience of drinking from a straw. And if you've had the experience of drinking from a coffee straw, you know, uh, you know that it takes a bit more pressure to suck up through a coffee straw because the because the um, the size of the straw is smaller. Now, just imagine taking a coffee straw and trying to suck up tapioca pudding. Is it going to work very well? No. Water? It's going to be a lot easier than tapioca, <clears throat> right? Because the tapioca is thicker. Well, the thicker the blood becomes, we call that viscosity, the, the more viscous or the thicker the blood becomes, then the more oomph it takes to try to get it through the blood vessels. And so the more dehydrated you are, then, uh, then the more resistance you have to that forward blood flow, and the more the heart has to push in order to get that blood th flow through, and then that's going to communicate more blood pressure through the system as well. So when you stay well hydrated, then that helps to uh, decrease the viscosity of the blood and so help things to, uh, to flow easier, to flow better. Um, and then, um, have, you ever, have you ever had honey in the wintertime? It's nice and crystallized. It's really, you know, and you're like... Plop. <coughs> Bet you have honey during the summertime. Like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's <coughs> it runs pretty quick. Well, sunshine helps. Because sunshine, not just because sunshine warms you up. Sunshine does warm you up, and that does help with blood pressure, actually, amazingly. Um, but it's not from a viscosity standpoint. What happens is when you get in the sunshine, well, of course, the heat from the sun through that radiant energy gets to you, strikes the skin. Your skin is uh, amazingly not transparent. So uh, the light, a lot of it gets absorbed. Uh, as it gets to the skin surface and when it gets absorbed it changes the type of energy it changes it to heat energy and so you have you've got uh, uh, heat and so you warm up when you're in the sunshine and when you warm up when you're in the sunshine warmth does this wonderful thing to blood vessels it causes them to dilate right? and uh, either you get the warmth directly to the blood vessels and it can cause them to dilate or through your nervous system when warmth gets to the skin then that's uh, that's basically metered or measured by the nervous system goes to the brain and then you have a response that goes back to the blood vessels that causes them to dilate and when your blood vessels dilate then it can decrease your blood pressure and in fact, when we have individuals, especially when it's a good time of year, not when it's like really cold out, but when it's a good, nice, warm time of the year, if we've got somebody that has high blood pressure, well, we'll go send them outside for a, for a sun bath. And while they're sunbathing, they, their blood pressure can drop 20 points, 30 points, sometimes 40 points, just with a 20-minute sun bath. And uh, it's a great way of doing that. Plus, it's nice to get your sunshine so you can have good vitamin D. And it helps with, like, everything else in your body. I don't know any system that's not uh, affected by vitamin D. All right. Now, also make sure that you get good sleep. At our Lifestyle Center, when we have individuals that... Um, 
you know, we're measuring blood pressures on a daily basis. Every morning we're getting blood pressures and seeing how things are going. If we see that there's a pretty, you know, a pretty steady trend, you know, there's always variations. But if it's a relatively steady trend and then all of a sudden one morning, blood pressure is quite a bit higher than it was before, my first question is, how did you sleep last night, right? How did you sleep last night? And, and, and almost always the answer is, oh man, I didn't, I didn't sleep well. I only got, you know, <clears throat> this many hours of sleep and, and whatever. You can see it. You can see it the next morning in the, in the blood pressure. So you got a bad night of sleep, blood pressure tends to be higher uh, the, the day after. So making sure that you get that good sleep uh, and getting to rest at a, at a good early time in the day. When should you be to bed by? Okay. When do you get to bed by? All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Before 11. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's better to get to, to sleep and get your rest before midnight. Right? So, uh, so the earlier you can get it before midnight, typically the better. We got some people around here, they get to bed at 8. And, uh, and uh, you know, so they get their 8 hours of sleep before midnight. Because what's that phrase? Uh, an hour before midnight is as good as two hours after. So, so they're like, well, I got my 8 hours before midnight. And they went to bed at 8. <laughs> And then they slept a few more hours and got up at three. And, uh, you know, and then their day began at that time. Now, it doesn't mean they have to get to bed at eight. But, you know, nine is a good time. Nine thirty is a good shot, you know. Uh, make sure you get to bed by about ten or so, um, at least by then. And, um, and that would be good for you. Early to bed, early to rise. Make someone. Yeah, it's not true. It is not true. Uh, healthy? Yeah, it's healthy. Wise? Yeah, it's wise. There's no guarantee it's going to make you wealthy. <laughs> right? So get some good sleep. That's important as well. Another thing that you can do to help with reducing blood pressure is making sure you breathe well. And there's a breathing exer exercise called 479 breathing that is helpful with bringing blood pressure down very rapidly. Right? This is a very rapid one, but it's not a very profound one. So you get about a 5, 10 point change in your blood pressure within about two minutes. Um, and, uh, and, and that's 479 breathing. So 479 breathing is very simple. You just breathe in for a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven, and then you breathe out slowly for a count of nine. nine. And then you again, you breathe in for four, you hold for seven, you breathe out for nine. All right, so we're going to do four, seven, nine breathing together. I'm taking the risk of doing this because if you do, you might fall asleep. But <coughs> let's go ahead and do it together. All right, so we're going to blow everything out first. All right, now in. One. Hold. Out. In, hold, out, in, hold, out. All right, and then you, you continue that for about 10, maybe 15 times in a row. Um, and in, in just three rounds, we have probably decreased the blood pressure in this room. If you take everybody that's sitting in here and the reduction in blood pressure just by those three rounds of breathing, we probably decreased the blood pressure of this room by 100 points or more, right? With everybody that's in here, just in that short period of time. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's something that's quite rapid, but it doesn't last really long. You know, it lasts like five minutes or two minutes or something like that. But every time you can bring your blood pressure down, if you have high blood pressure, it has a benefit, 
right? So even if you can bring it down for a little bit, then that has a benefit overall because the real, the damage that you have is the average blood pressure over a, over a long period of time. So if you can bring that average down just little bits at a time, then that has an, uh, has an impact. And then how often do you repeat it? Repeat it every hour or so that you're awake. You don't have to wake up to do this at night, but every hour that you're awake, repeat it again. Uh, another thing is to reduce your environmental noise. Right? There are studies that show that if you live on a house that's next to a road, that those that sleep in a bedroom that's next to the road, blood pressure is higher than those that sleep in the bedroom that's on the back side of the house. Unless you got the dogs and the roosters and all that kind of stuff on the back of the house. Um, so it, wherever the more quiet environment is, so if you're in a home with lots of little children, duct tape is wonderful. Uh, to do crafts with, right? <laughs> and to put things together and all of that kind of stuff. You were thinking I was thinking something else. <laughs> yes. Enjoy them while you've got them. It'll be quiet later. Um, but yes, reducing your environmental noise, that's something that's helpful for blood pressure. Also, hydrotherapy treatments. Uh, remember with the sunshine, when you have heat application to the body, it causes the blood vessels to dilate and so it helps the blood pressure to come down. So the same thing is true with water. If you use warm or hot water on the body, well not too hot, but uh, not painfully hot, but warm or hot water on the body, then it causes the blood vessels to dilate and it can help to bring the blood pressure down. One of the things you can do is a hot foot bath. So just relaxing your foot, you know, your feet in some water, maybe sitting on the side of the tub and filling it up with, with uh, warmer hot water and having your feet in there and just hanging out for about 20 minutes. Um, that's something that can help with bringing the blood pressure down. Just having a nice warm bath and, and relaxing in a warm bath, that can help to bring the blood pressure levels down as well. Um, and the more area of the body that you have covered or the more the whole body temperature increases, then the greater the effect usually is in regards to uh, that treatment. And how often can you repeat a bath? I don't know, I'll leave that with you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you do it too long, then a one-year-old turns into granny toes and grandpa toes, <laughs> you know. Um, our three-year-old's like, look, look, I've got grandpa hands. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. It's amazing how a grape turns into a raisin really fast, huh? Uh, when you get into a bath, how does that happen? You get into water, and you soak in water, and then you turn into a raisin. You think that the raisin should turn into a grape when you put it into water. Right, I'll let you think through that one. All right, and then step number 15, the last step that we'll look at for high blood pressure is, is eliminate your stress. So once stress is gone, what do you have to have high blood pressure for? You're probably like, oh, okay, yeah, good suggestion. How do I do that? Yeah, well, there's a number of ways of doing that, but I'd, I'd go to Uchi Pines, go to the YouTube channel, right? Go to Uchi Pines' YouTube channel. And uh, there's, a, there's a few series there that uh, I think will help with that. One of them I'd recommend, I'm not biased or anything, but it's called the Law of Life series. Um, and uh, help you understand things, put them in context uh, to help out with that stress. All right, now what about cholesterol? I mean, high cholesterol um, and uh, the adverse effects that go along with high cholesterol, like atherosclerosis. That's the thing that you dread the most when it comes to high cholesterol is the development of cholesterol plaques in the arteries and uh, then that resulting in heart attacks and brain attacks and kidney attacks and leg attacks and other attacks uh, where you cut off or you significantly limit the blood flow and then things beyond that limited blood flow die or feel really bad. So uh, how do you help you with your cholesterol levels to reduce them? Well, first of all, stop eating cholesterol. That's the big one. Stop eating it. Where do you find cholesterol? Animals. animals. That's right. That's where you find cholesterol. So animals or animal byproducts. So uh, if it's in an animal or it came from an animal, then it probably has cholesterol. 
Um, and, uh, and every cell of the body, it doesn't matter if you have the lean portions, you know, obviously this, this nice white stuff around the outside probably tastes pretty good and has a lot of fat in it. And so, well, that's the bone right there, but it uh, has quite a bit of fat. But even that red stuff in the middle, every cell in an animal contains quite a bit of cholesterol because it's part of the cell membrane. Cholesterol is part of the cell membrane of every cell in the animal, and it's what helps the cell membrane to be fluid so that you can move without cracking. Right? If you were a tree and you tried to walk around, then you'd go right? and it wouldn't work so well. Um, so you've got cholesterol to make you be nice and fluid while you're, while you're moving around. So that's in every cell of the animal. So it doesn't matter if you have lean cuts or not, it's, you've still got quite a bit of cholesterol with it. Um, and so animals are the source of cholesterol, and of course animal byproducts are involved in that as well. So anything that can squirt or drop out of an animal, it's got, it's got cholesterol too. And anything that's made from those things will have cholesterol in it also. All right, the second major point with cholesterol is eat lots of fiber. Where do you get fiber? Plants, plants that's right, plants. Um, so eat lots of fiber, because fiber does basically the opposite. Now, even if you are not eating cholesterol at all, you, don't, you, know, you cut animals out of your diet, you're completely on a plant-based diet, still eating more fiber is beneficial in reducing uh, cholesterol levels even more. The reason for that is you're always producing bile. And bile is to help to, in the digestion process, right? Specifically for helping to break down fats. Well, a major component of bile is cholesterol. It's a major component of, of bile. And what happens is you have cholesterol that's used in the process of making bile. The bile is dumped off into the digestive tract to help with the digestion process. And then about 95% of the cholesterol is reabsorbed back into the blood system back into the liver so that the liver can reuse it in making more bile. And so you have the, what's called an enterohepatic uh, circulation. And, uh, and one thing that disrupts that is fiber. Because once fiber starts going through the system, then when the bile gets around and attaches to the fiber, well, guess what the fiber doesn't get doesn't do. It doesn't get absorbed, right? And you don't have the ability to digest it and you can't absorb it. And so the fiber goes in one end and comes out the other. And guess what happens to the bile that got attached to the, to the fiber? Well, it goes out too. And so it decreases the amount of cholesterol that you can reabsorb from the bile that, you were, that the liver was dumping in with the food. So the more fiber you have, the more binding of the cholesterol and the less of it gets reabsorbed. And so even if you're not eating cholesterol, then more fiber in the diet can still decrease the cholesterol levels. <clears throat> and of course, fiber plants, right? That's a good place for them. You also wanna avoid fried foods and high fat foods, even if it doesn't have cholesterol in it, right? It could be uh, fried in vegetable oil or or other things like that. Um, and it might not have a shred of cholesterol in it, but when you have high, if when you have uh, fried foods and high fat foods, then uh, when you have more fats that you bring into the system, then the body produces more cholesterol with the more fats that you bring in, right? Uh, and so you'll basically drive your production of cholesterol because every cell in the body produces cholesterol. Liver is, prominent in that, but every cell of the body produces cholesterol because every, every cell in the body needs cholesterol. It's part of its cell membrane and part of its function and so on. Um, but you don't need too much. And so high fats and fried foods drives more production. And so you want to avoid those things that drive more production. All right. Um, now there are also studies that show that when you regularly eat nuts and seeds, that helps overall with your blood pressure, I mean, your, your blood cholesterol reduction. It also helps with reducing diabetes and it also helps with reducing uh, your other cardiovascular diseases uh, as well. Uh, so nuts and seeds are a good thing. The more regular you are in eating nuts and seeds, the better, to a point. 
If you eat nuts and seeds for breakfast, and nuts and seeds for snack, and nuts and seeds for lunch, and nuts and seeds for afternoon snack, and nuts and seeds for supper, and nuts and seeds for a, you know, evening snack, nope. You can do too much. You can, you can go nuts over nuts. And then they'll do nuts to you, right? It, it, it's just not going to work if you do it too much. So, so the ideal schedule with nuts and seeds is at least daily. Right. So make sure you get nuts and seeds on a daily basis. They do have quite a bit of fiber in them. It's true that they have natural fats, but they're natural fats, and they're packed in there with all sorts of antioxidants and so on. Just make sure what kind of nuts and seeds do you eat. Make sure it's not the nuts and seeds of the, the usual, oh, I, I was about to throw out a brand name. I probably shouldn't do that. Um, <coughs> of the usual variety that is cooked in oil and... Uh, you know, completely salted and maybe with honey and these other types of things where it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's about as bad as a honey baked ham. <laughs> Um, you know, so you can, you can do it bad or you can do it well. Usually dry roasted is, is better um, and, and so on. And then how much should you have? Well, it's, it's, it's about a large handful of, of nuts for the day or nuts and seeds for the day. Is, uh, is what's recommended, around 100 grams or three and a half ounces of nuts and seeds for the day. You also, th there, there's good plants and there's bad plants, right? Well, there's good, good plants and then there's bad, good plants. And the bad, good plants are the plants that have been processed a lot. So you have, you know, this comes from plants, believe it or not. That white bread comes from plants, that dessert, well, it comes from a combination of plants and animals, that comes from a combination of plants and animals, uh, that rice, well, it's plant, and all of those candies there, yeah, it's probably a lot of plant and a little bit of animal, but it's really processed, right? It's highly processed, that's not going to do you so good. Right? So the more you process plants, the less healthy it is for you. Of course, on there, uh, what's going to be the best? Probably the rice. It's probably going to be the best thing for you on there. Um, better if it was brown rice. So watch out for how processed it becomes. The more processed it is, the less healthy it is for you. You also want to avoid, especially if you are already on a plant-based diet, you've been working on this, your, your cholesterol levels are still elevated, they're not where you want them to be, then usually the two killers are oils and too much nuts. And that's usually where people really, you know, they're, they're, they don't have it quite right um, when it comes to their cholesterol levels and they're already on a plant-based diet. They're just, you want to back off on the oils or back away from the oils and then you want to limit the amount of nuts, right? You know, still have them on a regular basis, but now back off on the quantity uh, of nuts that you're consuming. What are some of the best nuts out there? Well, the best research is probably with black, with, uh, black walnuts. Uh, there's quite a bit of research with that. There's good research with uh, pecans and with almonds as well. Um, so those are uh, good variety nuts to choose. And then again, if your cholesterol levels are still high, then just back off a little bit on the quantity of nuts that you're eating when you're eating them, and then look at backing off on the oils. Also, uh, there are certain foods or supplements that help to lower cholesterol levels. Things like, again, barley. Hang on, we saw barley with blood pressure, didn't we? All right, B for barley for blood pressure, barley for cholesterol. Yeah, that doesn't work, does it? All right, for cholesterol, right? Helps with cholesterol as well. Niacin, B3, we saw that with blood pressure as well. Oh, helps with cholesterol too. So not only do you get to flush, but you're, you get to bring your blood, uh, your blood cholesterol levels down. Uh, Blonsillium, we saw that again too. That one was with uh, high blood pressure, so it helps with high cholesterol as well. Again, anything that's pretty much fiber, 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 it's gonna help with, with cholesterol. Oats as well. So you have that oatmeal at breakfast. I'm looking at a certain, you know, certain people. Oatmeal for breakfast, yeah, that's really good for you. Um, <coughs> uh, hence, our family will have good cholesterol levels because we eat oatmeal often. All right, red yeast rice. 
red yeast rice, that, uh, that is uh, something as well that is helpful um, when it comes to uh, blood cholesterol levels, to cholesterol levels as whole. In fact, uh, you know those statin medications uh, that they use for, for uh, cholesterol? This is where they actually found the first one actually comes from the red yeast rice and then they were able to purify it, um, concentrate it, purify it and all that kind of stuff, turn it into a medication and make billions and billions of dollars off of it. Um, but you can get it from its natural source in red yeast rice. Red yeast rice. Yeah, it's not rice. Rice. And, um, and you can find that typically in health food stores, or you can find it online, or something of that nature that can help additionally with helping to bring down blood cholesterol levels. And then you have beta glucans, uh, beta cytosterol, and uh, cytostanol, and phytosterols. Um, these are basically plant based cholesterols. Um, and yes, there are some plant based cholesterols, but they compete with cholesterol for absorption. And so they decrease how much cholesterol you absorb from the digestive tract, again, bile and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and also they're, they're easily, more easily excreted from the system. And uh, so those are helpful. What are some things that are high in that? Well, you have, of course, like your broccoli, you have your mushrooms, um, but you also have things like peanuts and avocado. Those are pretty good as well. Um, so those are things that you can look at. Um, and flaxseed. Flaxseed is uh, excellent from that standpoint. So eat plant phytosterols. So those are similar but different compounds. You've got avocado, flax, peanuts. They compete with cholesterol for reabsorption in the GI tract. I got ahead of myself by one slide. Look at that. Um, and uh, they're typically extruded back into the GI tract. And so that can help you with uh, cholesterol levels as well. So don't, don't shy away from avocado completely if you've got high cholesterol levels because it actually is good for you. Uh, just don't eat seven avocados a day. That's probably not going to be good for you. Everything good you can overdo, and then it ends up not being so good when you overdo it. Another good thing, exercise. So exercise is going to be helpful with your cholesterol levels. This will be one of the things that can increase your good cholesterol is uh, exercise. Now another thing that can increase your good cholesterol is the nuts and seeds. Right? So if your HDL levels are too low, that's your good cholesterol, then a couple of things you can do is uh, increase your nut and seed consumption and go out there and exercise some more. Those are some things that can help with that. But exercise overall tends to decrease your total cholesterol levels and decrease your bad cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol levels, and it tends to increase your good cholesterol levels as well. Uh, it can be cardiovascular exercise like apparently she is doing. Um, don't know if she's walking or dancing or uh, doing the moonwalk backwards or whatever, um, but also weightlifting as well. That can, uh, that can be helpful and beneficial from an exercise standpoint as well. And then the impossible thing that we talked about last time, eliminate stress. It's not impossible, but you know, it takes a, a new perspective. It really takes a new perspective in life uh, in regards to eliminating stress. And the foundation of that is trusting in God. Right? foundation of, of eliminating stress is trusting in the one who can control all the things that you can't control. Right? And that is trustworthy. And so that's where we need to go from that standpoint. All right, infections. I can tell we're not going to make it to diabetes, but that's fine. You got it in your handout, so you can, you can run over that as well. Hopefully not with the car. Um, so when it comes to infections, um, there are different things that can be beneficial. One of the things is increasing your blood flow to the area of the infection. That helps you because now you can have the immune system, uh, your white blood cells and so on coming to the area, the macrophages to be able to eat up things, your, your antigen presenting cells to get there and to identify what's there and then present it to the, to the other guys that are going to then start mounting antibody responses and, and your, your, all of that kind of stuff that happens. And so uh, you can increase your local, your blood flow to the area of infection by, by either doing uh, heat directly to the area or doing contrast to the area. 
Um, you've got contrast treatments, things like fomentations, where you get a moist, hot cloth that is put over the area of infection. So let's say that somebody has pneumonia. One of the things that we'll do for pneumonia is chest fomentations. And so you get, uh, we have fomentation cloths, but you don't have to have that. You can have a towel and, uh, you know, get it nice and moist. You can either throw it with a, you know, in a plastic bag and throw it in the microwave and heat it up, or you can boil water on the pot and then dip the towel down in there and try not to burn your fingers while you're, while you're getting it out and wringing it out. Um, so you can use steam, you can use boiled water, you can use the microwave, you can, I suppose you could throw it in the oven. Don't forget that it's there. Um, and, uh, you know, there's various different ways of heating it up, or you can use like a thermophore, which is a special heating pad. It's so much easier to use a thermophore. If you've ever tried to do fomentations in a home, sometimes you just don't do them because they're so, you know, it takes so much time and you've got to go to the stove and you've got to get this and you've got to go back over there and you've got to carry this with you. And then you just get a thermophore and you turn the thing on. Oh. So nice, right? Makes it so easy. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's Thermo4. T-H-E-R-M-O-P-H-O-R-E. Thermo4. Uh, it's uh, made out of Battle Creek, Michigan. Um, and uh, it's basically a heating pad, but it's made with the, the material of the fomentation pads, and it kind of draws moisture to it when you heat it up. And so it, it applies kind of a moist heat, and it's a bit hotter than the usual um, uh, heating pads, and uh, so you can get a good heating effect with that. So anyways, you, you apply fomentations as applying heat, you know, hot towels and other things like that, and then you take it off and you put ice water on there. <laughs> and then somebody's like, <laughs> you know, uh, with that, and you do that for about 30 seconds, and, and then you, you put the heat back on, they're like, oh, praise God, thank you. And uh, then that gets hot, and then they start getting sweaty, and then you go for the second round of ice water. <laughs> you know, but it's not so <laughs> as it was before. And then by the time you get done to the end, and you've done about five to seven rounds of this, they're like, oh, yeah, please give me the cold, give me the cold, you know, um, and, uh, and so on. So you can do it that way, or you can do it with immersing the, the part of the body that's infected under hot water. You know, so if you've got an infected elbow, then you stick it down in hot water. An infected head, stick it down in the water. Um, all right, you, all right, you got you got that one. All right, um, and uh, you know, infected toes, stick it in the water, and so on. So you can do a bath from that standpoint, and. Uh, and then, of course, there's other things that can help to improve the immune function. Fasting, sometime, uh, that can be beneficial. Why? Because you're just you're you're relieving the system of work, so that you can conserve for the immune function. Right. And so, uh, just letting the digestive system rest for a little bit while you're in the process of that healing process, uh, that can be beneficial. Sometimes. That's a natural part of the healing process. And so you get sick, and guess what? Your appetite goes, <laughs> you don't want to eat? That's actually a protective mechanism, right? To keep you from stuffing more stuff down there, causing you to you know, do all the work of digesting and all that kind of stuff, burdening the system with more you know, with more food when you've already had too much already, and, and so on. So fasting can be beneficial for uh, immune function, but not too long, right? You can fast too long, and then it becomes detrimental. How long is too long? Yes. Answer is depends. And um, <clears throat> where's the line? Well, it depends on how small the person is, depends on how much weight they had before they started the process, depends on what they're sick with, depends, there's a lot of things that it depends on, and I can't go through all of it to, to, uh, to describe that. So uh, if you don't know, then call Uchi Pines, talk to Helena, she'll walk you through it, um, or one of the medical staff. Um, all right, so exercise is also beneficial for uh, infections and, and improvement from infections as well. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, um, well, let's see, one of the, 
And, and it can be from interesting things too, like malaria. Uh, I've only gotten one malaria protocol that, uh, I, that I know of individuals that have tried it out in the field with falciparum malaria, which is the really bad guy that usually kills people with malaria. And from a natural remedy standpoint, usually hydrotherapy, it'll work with the other strains of, uh, of malaria, but not with falciparum. Doesn't seem to have a big, big effect on falciparum. But uh, one of the treatment protocols that I've gotten from some individuals that have treated that, off in Africa and other places, uh, involves exercise. So that when the individual starts getting sick with malaria and they start getting that headache and that achy feeling that you know goes along with malaria, because if you've ever had malaria, you know what it feels like. And you and, uh, start getting that and then a lot of exercise, I mean, like going out to the point that you are just dripping with sweat and just really dripping with sweat um, <coughs> and, um, and, you know, real vigorous exercise and doing that right towards the beginning uh, of the infection. Uh, has been something that they have found that has worked. Um, although it depends on what circumstance and what infection you have as to how much exercise can be beneficial. If you're sick with, uh, if you're sick with Epstein-Barr virus and you've got the kissing disease, right, mono, well, yeah, and maybe some moderate exercise but not too much because uh, fatigue is going to be a huge problem uh, <coughs> with that. And then you could have an enlarged spleen, so you want to make sure that you avoid uh, at least contact sports and that kind of stuff. Uh, hyperthermia baths, that means that you get in bath with hot water and it causes you to have a, a fever, right? Why is it that you develop a fever when you get sick? Because it helps you get well. Right? It's part of the healing process. Why is it that we give Tylenol and Motrin to everybody that has a fever? I don't know, because it doesn't help us get better, right? Have the fever, right? Um, so a hypothermia bath and forcing yourself to have a fever, that's going to be helpful. Contrast showers, the hot part's good, cold part, <laughs> right? Dance, 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 and then back to the hot, and then to the cold, and then back to the hot and the cold. Being out in the sunshine, that's going to be beneficial. Um, not only the warmth, but the vitamin D that you get from it. Individuals do much better with infections when they have good vitamin D levels. Much better than those that don't, and especially with this whole, I was almost to say the wrong word, pandemic. Um, there was an L that I was going to add to that, but, um, <coughs> there, but with this whole thing, um, individuals that have normal vitamin D levels do so much better than those that don't. Uh, they're significantly less uh, admitted to the hospital, and if they're in the hospital, significantly less get on a ventilator uh, compared to those that have low vitamin D levels. And then, of course, sleep. That's going to be helpful and beneficial as well. Oops, let's switch that slide. We don't want anybody to be embarrassed by being in the tub. Yeah. All right, so there's, uh, you can also use nature's penicillin. Uh, that's uh, something, and again, if you got notes, they're right there in your notes, so you should be able to uh, have that and access that. But nature's penicillin includes an orange, a grapefruit, two lemons, three cloves of garlic, a half of a large onion, three drops of peppermint oil, and if you're really steaming for a, uh, a real punch, then you can throw some cayenne pepper in there as well with it, <coughs> and uh, it'll kick you hard. Now, the, with the orange, the grapefruit, and the lemons, you just want to, you don't want to peel it like you normally peel citrus, because usually you peel it all the way down to the fruit, and, the, and you want to get a peeler, and then just peel the colored part off and leave the white underneath it. Right? You want to leave the white pulpy stuff that's underneath it there, but just peel the surface layer, the colored layer off of them, and then you put them in whole, seeds and all. Right? They go in whole, cut them, put them in, in the blender with just enough water that you need to, to actually blend it well, and then add a few drops of peppermint oil at the end and blend it just enough to get that mixed in. And, uh, and then you use about a cup a day periodically throughout the day. If you're really into it, you can push it more than that. But just watch out. Um, uh, yeah, you can... You can try it out on an empty stomach and see how your stomach does with it. Some people do not do well on an empty stomach with it, so you might want to have to have it after uh, some food. 
but uh, it's uh, beneficial in the case of infection as well. And then there's <gasps> da -da -da -da! charcoal, beneficial for everything in the world, right? Uh, if you don't have charcoal, you are missing out on the greatest friend of humanity uh, outside of Jesus. Um, so, so charcoal is there, for, I mean, it's like the natural remedy of natural remedies. Uh, you can use it for almost anything. Of course, it does have some negative consequences like constipation. Uh, you don't ever want to use powdered charcoal and take it internally while it's still in a powdered state because if you've ever dealt with the powdered charcoal, you know all you have to do is go and then it's like and then it's floating around everywhere, right? Um, and what happens if you take any of that powdered stuff internally, then if you go, then it just goes right down into your lungs. And there's one place where charcoal is not good. And that's in your lungs. Right? Charcoal is not good in your lungs. So, so if you're taking it internally, it should be in the form of like a tablet or a capsule or uh, moistened. So you can swallow it and not breathe it. <coughs> and uh, charcoal can be used internally, of course. Uh, it helps with poisonings, it helps with uh, digestive issues, any inflammation that you have going on in the digestive tract, that's going to help there. If you're trying to deal with uh, inflammation or infections that involve anything with the bloodstream, that's where you're going to want to put it to because that's the closest place you can get the charcoal to the bloodstream. Because you got a whole bunch of area where all you have is one cell layer thick of of, on the digestive wall, and you have one cell layer thick on the blood vessel, and that's all that's separating the two. And, uh, and so you can have some really good effect through the digestive tract. Um, but also you can use charcoal superficially. You can use it on uh, topical applications, an abscess, uh, 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 some kind of ulcer, or uh, you can use it on uh, cellulitis, or, or any kind of superficial type of, uh, of uh, infection. Just watch out when you use charcoal topically that you don't put the charcoal directly on an acute wound. Right? So if you have uh, where the, the skin has opened up recently and it's going to close fairly quickly, you don't want to put charcoal directly on that uh, because it can tattoo the area. Uh, if you have a chronic wound, so somebody has, you know, they've got like a venous stasis ulcer or something that's been there for, for weeks or months or something like that, you can put char charcoal directly in that. It's not going to tattoo. It's the acute wounds that are an issue. But if you're using it over an acute wound, then all you do is put a layer of paper towel between the charcoal and your application and you're, you're good, right? And, uh, and uh, so with the natural remedies classes, I'll talk about more how to do that. There are antimicrobial agents like American ginseng, golden seal, echinacea, oregano oil, grapefruit seed extract, tea tree oil. There's a whole bunch of others as well. Um, if I haven't listed your favorite herb, it's just because I'm not going to list every herb because uh, there are a lot of them that, uh, that have benefit as far as immune function is concerned. And uh, many of these can be taken internally or externally. Some of them you have to watch out uh, that you don't want to use during pregnancy uh, or lactation. And you got to watch out on your quantities of taking them internally, like oregano oil. If you have ever tried oregano oil, it is hot. It's hot. I mean, that thing burns. You know, so when you're taking it internally, you probably don't want anything more than about four drops at any time that you're taking it, you know, and mixing it into something and, and so on. So you gotta watch out for that. Uh, echinacea is okay for pregnancy. It's okay for little ones. Um, so the echinacea flower, that one is, is, is okay for pretty much anyone. Um, and then another one that usually works pretty well during pregnancy and childhood is, um, um, Oh, elderberry. Right. Elderberry is, is, uh, is okay for the little ones as well. And then of course you can use poultices, uh, various different poultices that can be helpful. Uh, here we have a cabbage poultice and here's a regular charcoal poultice and, and we use castor oil frequently um, because of its uh, anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, all of those can be beneficial but really if you are dealing with an infection infection, eh, charcoal is probably your best 
your best shot. Uh, if you're looking at pain, uh, cabbage is pretty good, but I wouldn't be using cabbage over top of a, like an infected wound or anything like that. It, really, you'd be looking at uh, charcoal if you're going to be using it. That's going to be your better option from that standpoint.